Boy, let me tell you guys, it's great to finally be back in a scripted, more formal video. Like, it's actually long overdue. Oh, and you see this grease stain on the screen? This monstrosity? This mega cringe rant sona that I made in five minutes almost two years ago? Yeah, say goodbye to him. His contract expired, he's getting replaced, he's getting sentenced to an eternity of turning red. And I do hear you asking, but Pesky, what are you gonna be replacing him with then? And, you know, personally, I'm glad you asked. Introducing the new, the improved, upgraded funny blue rant Sona that is, depending on your point of view, either demonstrably more or less cringe. If you find yourself holding the former point of view, then I guess my only saving grace here is that I'm self-aware about it. If you've been here long enough, and I'm sure a lot of you have, you'll remember that my most recent and only essay style video was this one. You know, the infamous Anki video. Now, did this video single-handedly save our little fat ass tank boy's fate? I, I don't know. I like to believe it did. I mean, Anki did get an official redesign shortly afterwards, so I'm just gonna bring that to its logical conclusion and take the credit. But my point here in referencing that video is that through the discussion it generated within the IELTS community, we were able to achieve an overall net positive result for the IELTS itself. Populism at its finest. And yes, by the way, I do in fact remember how contentious the relationship between the community and the devs became in the aftermath of me releasing that video, which is precisely the reason I'm bringing it up again. As you can already tell by the title, of this video, we're going to be discussing a topic and ideas about said topic that could potentially see the Isles community rally behind this video. I'm going to be completely upfront about it in saying that yes, I do want the Isles developers to be influenced by this video. In fact, I'll take it a step further. My end goal in making this video is for the dev team to hear what I have to say and decide on their own accord to take my advice based on the arguments I make. I believe that the Isle would benefit greatly from implementing the ideas that I will be presenting today, so it's only natural that I want to make my voice heard. However, just because I want to sway their decision making does not mean that I want them to be harassed. If you feel inclined to vocally support my ideas in this video, by all means do so, I'd greatly appreciate it but be respectful and mature about it. Remember that when trying to argue a point, acting like a degenerate is probably gonna be counterproductive. I just want to make that clear before jumping into anything. So please guys, just work with me on this one. I'd be ever so thankful. The other night, I was in a VC with my friend Javert playing the aisle, and in typical pesky fashion, I set myself spiraling into a blind rage over a certain issue that I had zero control over. And that issue was Avrima's stat balancing. And it's not even like I was angry about it because I got killed or something. The Karno I was playing as was alive and well. The poor balancing of the game just happened to aggravate me out of nowhere for no reason. And you know what? Rightfully so, considering that this bastard exists. My anger primarily stemmed from the most recent patch to Avrima, which opened the gates to a few new dinosaur stat alterations. Some dinosaurs reaped their rewards, others not so much, and some served as living proof that nothing is ever done to eliminate corruption. But the bottom line is that the Isles community has been barking mad for months complaining about balance ever since the abysmal update 3.75 launched. You know, the one that nerfed all the small animals and buffed all the big ones. Now to their credit, the Isles developers and quality assurance team have tried to solve all the issues that have arisen since. But the problem is, they seem to be fixing all the wrong things. And this isn't a problem unique to Avrima either. Legacy was actually the same way. The fact that they were unable to achieve some form of dinosaur stat equilibrium in Legacy was part of the reason for Avrima's creation in the first place. But honestly, part of me doesn't even blame the devs for not knowing which balance choices to make. It doesn't exactly help when you have 60,000 goons screeching in your ear about why you should buff their favorite dinosaur and nerf all the others. Anyway, my contagious dissatisfaction eventually infected Javert, and so we started spitballing random changes that could make the Isles PvP experience more tolerable. And admittedly, in the first few minutes, it seemed like an impossible task. But luckily, Z and I harnessed the overwhelming power of our rage, and using our combined total of 14 and a half brain cells, we were able to solve every single balance issue currently in the aisle in one single late night conversation. Yes, you heard me. Every single one in one night. Sure, it took us staying up until 5am to work out all the numbers, but I'd rather 5am than 5 years at Dondi's. Today, in this new episode of Isle Discussion, we're gonna go one step beyond. No, we're gonna go 10 steps beyond. A hundred steps, a thousand. Ladies, gentlemen, and that Technicolor rainbow in between, we aren't going to be saving one mere dinosaur this time. This time, we're going to be saving all of them. We are going to save the Isle from an eternity in balancing hell before it's too late. This is how to balance the Isle once 
and for all. Everima, of course, not legacy, because, well, obviously. I have two primary reasons for proposing an overhaul to the Isle's current balance. One, to make dinosaurs feel more powerful than they are currently as a means to make them more enjoyable and satisfying to play as. And two, to eliminate the excessive power gap that exists between several dinosaurs. Because unfortunately, the Isle of Rima right now makes pretty much every dinosaur except for the ones at the top feel incredibly weak. The best example of this is Utah Raptor. Utah Raptor's current bite damage in Avrima is 55. 55 damage is so stupidly weak in comparison to the rest of the larger animals in the cast, so much so that it's to the point where it isn't even worth using Utah's bite. And while I 100% agree that a Utah Raptor should be opting for its pounce rather than its bite for its primary method of attack, that doesn't mean the bite should feel useless in tacking on damage. When participating in actual gameplay, a number that small means virtually nothing, especially when Carnotaurus is able to three-shot a Utah. This forces Utah players to rely almost exclusively on their pounce making fighting against Utahs stupidly predictable. Of course, this issue doesn't only apply to just Utah. Carno, Tananto, and even Paki are also quite predictable and feel as if they're lacking in damage. Then, meanwhile, you've got the two big guys, Stego and Dino, who not only have amazing damage outputs, but stupidly high health, meaning that the weak damage outputs of the smaller animals cannot even lay a finger upon them. In fact, this problem is so noticeable that I believe that it's on the path to creating a toxic, unfair ecosystem exactly like the one Legacy Isle had, where the largest dinosaurs reigned supreme, and the smaller, weaker dinosaurs were forced to live in the shadows and could hardly defend themselves if they were to be attacked. Important note, I am not advocating for cutting down the largest dinosaurs so that they are equal in power against mid-tier and small tier animals. That would be stupid, and also exemplify why the practice of equity is cringe. I'm simply calling attention to the power scaling error that ruined Legacy, and is beginning to rear its ugly head once again in Avrima. What I am advocating for is a reduction of this gargantuan power gap between dinosaurs, because the moment you let a gap this wide take hold, it relegates everything on the lower side of the gap to the sidelines. So naturally, Z and I got to work crunching the numbers, and after a few hours of calculation and deliberation, we eventually came up with some numbers that seemed almost foolproof. Now, you guys know me. I won't outwardly show this level of confidence unless I'm 100% sure of myself, so take my word for it on this one. I believe that this list of numbers right here is the key to saving the aisle and never having to touch a single stat on any dinosaur of the current Avrima roster ever again. And if you look closely and compare these numbers to the dinosaur's current stats, you'll notice that every dinosaur, yes, every dinosaur, received at least one buff. These numbers right here will accomplish the two things that Evrima so desperately needs, making sure every dinosaur feels rewarding and satisfying to play as, and reducing the overall power gap between animals while still keeping the ecosystem in check. You know, so we don't have stegos running away from subadult Carnos. What I'm going to do now is go through this list species by species and explain to you the ideal function of each one in the Isles ecosystem. This will also give me the chance to hand the spotlight over to the new hypothetical stats that we've come up with for each so that you can process them on an individual level and not just on a boring list. Alrighty, Islanders, let's jump right into this. <laughs> Let's get into what the ideal ecological niche of each dinosaur is and overview the individual stats that will allow them to fit nicely into that niche. Let's start with a dinosaur that I am not at all biased in favor of in any way, shape, or form. Carnotaurus. We've set up Carnotaurus to be a glass cannon assassin that is able to gain and keep the upper hand in fights by allowing him to deal a ton of damage if he's able to properly pull off a long range ambush with his charge ability. If he's unable to achieve this ambush, however, he will struggle more than most other carnivores would in a more confrontational hunt. Also, stamina management is key. His primary targets for solo hunting would be animals that are Myasaurus sized and smaller. However, there's no prey items in the Maya size range yet. So for now, we'll say Tenantum sized and smaller. In a pack, Carno would ideally be able to hunt slightly larger yet specific prey options such as Paris or Olyphus, and the absolute largest prey item that a Carnotaurus pack would be capable of hunting would be... Stegosaurus. Now, before you scream, but, but, but my small game hunter though, let's put a pin in that. More on Stego versus Carno later. Dinosuchus. Dino will still function relatively the same as he does now, but with more power behind his attacks and less room to compensate for error as a trade-off. Dinosuchus should be an absolute powerhouse that can hunt most anything that crosses its path, 
but carries the burden of the obvious weaknesses of a real-life crocodile. Dryosaurus. Dryo will also play relatively similar to how he always has, as a swift but weak Juke Master 69. Saying that though, we'll be giving him just a bit more of a fighting chance in the form of increased damage as well as increased health. This way, cocky baby carnivores that try to mess with Dryo may potentially be in for a rude awakening. Hypsilophodon. This guy's just a rat who just so happens to be the ultimate troll. Not much is changing with him. Pachycephalosaurus. In our hypothetical, Pachy will be following the trend of being made stronger overall, but still scaling correctly with his opponents as they too have all received buffs. We want Packy to be an angry little dude with the ability to pummel predators in his size range or smaller into an absolute pulp if they're not careful, and to be able to deter larger predators that underestimate his bone-cracking capabilities. And while a solo Packy will most often lack the power to outright kill larger opponents like Carno, a Packy with some friends will certainly be able to show that same Carno what for. Pteranodon. Terra is, all things considered, just a bird. He shouldn't be all that strong. Otherwise, you just get beast of Bermuda birds. He's a fisher and a scavenger, don't forget. Stegosaurus. Stego is currently and always has been in this weird spot of being on the verge between a large tier herbivore and an apex tier herbivore. He can dish out massive damage, but cannot take any substantial hits at all. Or at least that's how it should be. And now that Stego's attack actually takes a bit more brain function to land successfully than the Legacy version, we've decided to go full speed ahead with Stego becoming the glass cannon of the large tier herbivores, similar to how Carnotaurus is the glass cannon of the mid tier carnivores. But again, to the Stego mains, do not worry. You guys will be fine, as I'll explain in a minute. You'll just have to be a little more careful around Carno, Utah, and Dino, instead of completely destroying all three of them by breathing in their direction. Tenantosaurus. Tenanto has had a lot of ups and downs in the short time that it's been present in the aisle. It seems like the playstyle they've been trying to give Tenanto is that he's a sort of underdog herbivore where the absolute largest carnivore that he can reliably defeat in a one-on-one -on -one battle is the Carnotaurus. Based on this, I would assume that Tenanto will be capable of battling Ceratosaurus and Baryonyx, but against an Allosaurus or an Albertosaurus, his best bet would probably be to make a run for it. Utah Raptor. Utah is a great dinosaur for both beginners and veterans alike. Unfortunately though, Utah right now is a little bit lackluster. What the? We've come to the conclusion that the best course of action is to beef him up a little bit while making sure he still scales well with the rest of the other changes that we made, similar to the treatment that Packy received. Like Packy, Utah would end up getting crushed by every larger animal if we didn't roid him up a bit. But fear not, that doesn't mean Utah's gonna be a tank. In fact, he's still incredibly fragile. He's going to be keeping his niche as an agile pack hunter that primarily hunts targets much larger than himself. He'll just be a bit better at it. Alrighty, everyone. It's time to explain what happens when these numbers collide with one another, and thus why these specific numbers are the absolute best choices that could possibly be made. And I'm not really a math expert either, by the way. It's always been my worst subject, so like, if you see a math error here, just, just call me out on it. Before we get started with this section, I want to note a few things. I will be predominantly talking about stats that relate to damage values exclusively, meaning damage and health. The current speed, agility, bleed damage, and stamina values for each dinosaur will be kept the same as in the live build unless explicitly stated otherwise. Also, when I mention a dinosaur's health, that value will also act as its weight in kilograms. I've been critical of the weight equals health system in the past, but it's not going to be going away, so the best option here is to work with it. And actually, I'm quite glad I did decide to work with it. The numbers that we came up with actually complement the weight equals health system quite well. But since nearly every dinosaur has seen some form of a change to its health, this means that it will also be seeing a change to its weight. Javert and I did our best to make sure that these health alterations would affect dinosaur interactions that take weight into account as little as possible, since these interactions are, for the most part, already well balanced. If any of the proposed weight values end up messing up interactions between one or more non-fully grown animals, we would recommend a rescaling of how quickly or slowly an animal gains weight as it grows larger throughout its life cycle. Now it's time to get into the specifics of why all of these stat values will work pretty much perfectly if they are applied together in the current game. I'll be going over each matchup in the entire game in alphabetical order, starting with all of Carno's matchups, then followed by all of Dino's matchups, excluding Carno vs. Dino, because we'll have already covered it in the Carno section. Next, we'll cover all of Dryo's matchups, excluding both Carno and Dino, etc, etc, you get the picture. Important note, keep in mind for this section that headshot damage has a multiplier of 1.5 times on all dinosaurs except for Stego, who takes 2 times damage on headshots, and Packy, 
who takes reduced damage of an unknown value on headshots. Carno versus Carno. With 200 bite damage and 1,850 health, Carnotaurus will be able to 10 shot each other, assuming that all hits are body hits. For a mirror matchup, this is a nice medium to have, especially since Carnotaurus are cannibals. More than 10 body shots would favor dumb players who opt to face tank their opponents, and less than 10 would encourage players to go for cheap kills instead of carefully planning their attack against an opponent of equal strength. Plus, with its 300 damage charge, a smart Carno would be able to deal a maximum of 1,050 damage to another Carno, meaning that he landed a headshot charge coupled with two headshot bites. The two bites are derived from the maximum amount of hits you could land on an opponent during the duration of a stun. That leaves the opponent Carnotaurus with only 800 health left. If the Carnotaurus gets all base damage hits, meaning body shots, he will deal 700 damage with a charge and two bite combo. That sounds like an effective assassin class to me. Carno vs Dino Unless it's a baby Dino, Carno shouldn't really be actively hunting a Dino. It's way out of Carno's league. However, Carnos often have to battle over carcasses against crocodiles. For our purposes, Dinosuchus has received a bite damage buff from 500 up to 600. If Carno kept his current health value at 1800, that means that Dino would clean 3-shot Carno with body shots, which felt a bit unfair, especially since Carnos will need to defend their food from the hungry dials. To counteract this, we gave Carno an extra 50 HP, meaning that Carno can just barely survive either three body shots or two headshots from a Dino. You'll come to find that giving players leeway to survive a dangerous encounter with a slither of health left is a common theme in our balance changes. Keep in mind that this change is still an overall buff to Dino in the Carno vs Dino matchup, as Dino has 100 more base damage than before, and that scales even more when landing a headshot. As I say this though, our Dino has been dropped down from 8000 to 6500 HP, primarily for the Dino vs Stego matchup, which we will discuss soon. Our 200 damage Carno needs to land 33 body shots to a 6.5k HP Dinosuchus to dispatch it. So while a Carno taking down a Croc player is slightly more feasible than before, it's still no easy task whatsoever, and would require the crocodile to be unreasonably far inland. And let's be honest here, if a croc lets a Carno get 33 whole hits on it, it deserves to be put in the ground. That will also be a common theme in this video. Carno versus Dryo. Dryo is nothing but food for Carno. Carno will continue to one-shot it as it always has, despite Dryo's slight health buff. Moving on. Carno versus Hipsy. Same as Dryo, except this one isn't even worth the energy for Carno to try and catch. Hipsy stay winning. Moving on. Carno versus Packy. This matchup will be staying relatively the same as it is now. With his 200 bite damage and 300 charge damage, our Carno will be able to dispatch our 600 HP Packy with either 3 body shots from a bite or one charge and two body shot bites. Keep in mind that Packy takes reduced damage on both his head and tail, so Carno will have to either opt for a charge or be slightly more precise with his bites, since three base damage bites equal Packy's HP exactly. Carno has no room for any leeway in hitting Packy on the armored parts of his body if he wants to secure the kill in the minimum three hits. This, of course, will help encourage the use of assassination tactics via Carno's charge. Meanwhile, Packy, dealing 170 base damage from a fully charged ram attack, would allow him to 11 shot Carno with body hits. We wanted to keep Packy's raw power while also taking into account the fact that all three types of fractures that Packy can deal are actually devastating now. With these numbers, Packy is discouraged from outright attempting to kill a Carno in a 1v1 and instead would be wiser to opt for landing a fracture and running. However, if the Packy has some buddies to back him up, Combined, they will still have the raw power and agility to pound an overconfident Carno into a pulp. Also remember that in the time frame of a battle against multiple packies, Carno is almost guaranteed to sustain one or more fractures, so 11 base damage hits to kill is more than fair, especially for such a relatively small animal. Carno vs Terra. Nothing to see here, just another one-shot matchup. Carno vs Stego. Remember how I said Carno cannot be allowed to tackle large armored herbivores? Well, that rule still holds, but as I said, there's an exception to every rule, and I believe that exception applies to the glass cannon of the large herbivores, Stegosaurus. Important note, I am not advocating for Carnotaurus to regularly hunt Stego, as I will prove to you in one moment. I'm simply saying that it should be a much more feasible task than a Carno hunting a Triceratops, which should be virtually impossible. The enormous disparity in the Carno vs Stego matchup that currently exists is going to be reduced drastically with our balance changes. My primary reasoning for this is that in Stego's current state, I worry that it will be impossible for Aloe, Alberto, or even Acro to be able to hunt it, 
and those three should be much bigger enemies to Stego than Karno is. With Karno's 200 bite damage, he'll be dealing 400 damage per bite to a Stego for each headshot that he lands upon it. Remember that Stego has a 2 times headshot multiplier, not 1.5. With Stego's 4,250 health, this would leave Stego with 250 health remaining after 10 Karno headshot bites, the final 11th bite being the finishing blow. If 11 headshots sounds like too few to you, remember that Stego's turn in place is incredibly quick, and Karno dies instantly the moment he is stabbed in the face by a Stego. The 1.5 times headshot multiplier would allow Stego's 1300 damage tail swing to deal a whopping 1950 damage, more than enough to strike a Karno down in a single blow. If you have the capability to one-shot an animal in the face and leave it with only 550 health remaining after a body shot, there is absolutely no excuse whatsoever to let that animal bite you in the face 11 whole times. But I digress. The message that we want to send to Carno players is that while it's certainly possible for a Carno to bring down the glass cannon of the large herbivores, you better assemble a pack for this one, and also understand the immense risk that those Thagomizers impose, especially when you specialize in bringing down prey your size and smaller. On the contrary, this sends the message to Stego players that while they have the sheer power to very quickly and easily dispatch opponents that are both larger or smaller than them, they must protect their head at all costs or else. Stego, like Karno, best fits the glass cannon role of their respective size ranges. If Stego is kept as both powerful and a health tank, then there's no way that Allosaurus and friends will have a winnable matchup against Stego in the future, especially since all of them are slower than Karno, and therefore much more likely to get hit in a battle. Karno vs. Tenanto It's no secret that the Karno vs. Tenanto matchup has been all over the place, and one dinosaur usually tends to gain a stupidly fair advantage over the other each time any of their stats are changed by a single digit. Ideally, though, this matchup should be the most even one in the Avrima roster so far. The assassin that can attack at lightning speed with high damage versus the underdog with the ability to counter that speed with equally powerful attacks that he can throw out as he pleases. With our 200 bite damage Karno, it would take 9 base damage strikes to a Tenanto to fully deplete him of his 1650 health. That extra 50 health is imperative here, because it prevents Tenanto from dying to only 8 Karno bites, which we felt was incredibly cheap. On the contrary, Tenno's kick attack is equally as powerful as Karno's bite, also dealing 200 damage. 10 kicks to a Karno's body would secure the kill in this case. Keep in mind, when Tenanto lands a kick, he will likely be following up with several different combinations of attacks, so the maximum damage able to be applied is much greater than 200. Tenanto's Tail Slam and Karno's Charge also have the same damage values, 300 damage for both. If Tenanto lands an optimal combo, meaning a Headshot Tail Slam, followed by two more Headshot Tail Slams, that'll be 1,350 damage inflicted upon the Karno, leaving him with 500 health to spare. Otherwise, if it's three base damage Tail Slams, Karno loses 900 health, leaving him with 950 health left. If Karno lands an optimal combo on Tenanto, meaning a headshot charge and three headshot bites, that will leave Tenanto with 300 health left, removing 1,350 of it. Otherwise, if it's a base damage charge comboed with three base damage bites, that will leave Tenanto with only 750 health remaining, removing 900 of it. These are some harsh punishments for getting hit, but these crazy damage outputs actually complement each other. To win this matchup efficiently, Karno is almost exclusively reliant on his charge, which is a tool for pulling off long-range ambushes. A smart Tenanto player will 1. be aware of his surroundings, and 2. keep a Karno close while fighting it so that it cannot gain enough distance to activate a charge. Without an ambush, Karno is forced to engage in close combat against the Tenanto, which is not something you want to do when it can attack with the speed and damage to match your own strength. Tenanto's stamina cost reduction on his attacks drives this point home even further. On the flip side, if the Tenanto does not react quickly enough to the Karno's charge, which as stated will typically be Karno's only reliable path to victory, the Karnotaurus has earned the right to end the fight as quickly as possible and eviscerate as much of the Tenanto's health as it can. I also hear you asking, but pesky, if Karno has 1,850 health, and Tenanto's Tail Slam is 300 damage, doesn't that mean it would take 7 whole Tail Slams to kill a Carnotaurus? And right you are, that is exactly the case! We made Carnotaurus purposefully just survive 6 Tenanto Tail Slams to both account for headshot damage, and to encourage the Tenanto to mix up his attacks and tack on smaller bits of damage if he wants to secure the kill. After taking either 4 Tail Slams to the head or 6 Tail Slams to the body, Karno will have 50 HP left in both situations. From there on out, all it takes for Tenanto to send the Karno to Davy Jones' locker is either 230 damage bites 
or 125 damage claw slash. Of course, a kick and a tail slam would also suffice. This is another area where Tanato's reduced stam cost on attacks comes in. He has plenty of stam to finish the job if the Karno doesn't retreat while it can. Karno vs Utah. Like Karno vs Paki, Karno vs Utah will stay relatively unchanged. The main differences are as follows. If Karno rams a Utah in the body, he will be able to kill it in just one bite, since our Utah has 500 health, and our Karno has 300 charge damage and 200 bite damage. Fair, considering that Utah has spectacular agility, more than enough to dodge a Karno's charge, even up to the last second. As always, Karno still three shots Utah with traditional body hits. Utah has also been given some extra little treats to help out against Karno's that get too big for their britches, though. Utah's buff to 80 bite damage will now allow him to kill our 1850 HP Karno in 24 bites, which sounds like a lot, but is great for tacking on little bits of damage in a pack hunt. Karno's will have to be quite a bit more careful when not letting Raptors wear them down. Overall, these changes will keep Karno holding the upper hand, yet give Utah a little more leeway in bringing down Carnotaurs that they are able to outsmart. Phew, that was a lot. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm so over talking about Carnotaurus. Putting my bias aside, Carno is such a specialized animal that he needs some super in-depth discussions, as well as a lot of premeditated planning to keep him from being either incredibly overpowered or just plain terrible. But hopefully now you all can see how these stats will allow Carnotaurus to specialize in long-range ambushes and assassinations, while simultaneously reining him in so that he doesn't completely steamroll the animals within his own weight class. Now, let's move on to Dino's matchups. Keep in mind that we've already covered all of Karno's matchups, so Karno won't be appearing in this section or any other future sections. Once we're done with Dino, the same will apply to him for the next sections. Dino versus Dino. The health nerf to 6550 and damage buff to 600 will help this mirror matchup in its pacing to an incredible degree. With the current 8000 HP and 500 damage, it takes Dino 16 whole hits to kill another fully grown Dino. So oftentimes it'll devolve into... <laughs> With these new stats, Dinos will dispatch one another in 11 body shots or 8 headshots. Still a fairly high number, but it will create a much more fast-paced and high-stakes fight than it is right now. Dino vs Dryo, rip Dryo. Dino vs Hipsy, rip Hipsy. Dino vs Packy, rip Packy. Actually, fun fact, we decided that we wanted to buff Packy's HP to 600 pretty early on in coming up with these stats. We were originally going to leave Dino at 500 damage until we realized how stupid it would be if Dino couldn't one-shot a Packy with a bite. So Dino's buff to 600 damage comes from Packy's health buff, Karno's small health buff comes from Dino's 600 damage buff, etc. It really enlightened me to how even the slightest stat change can have a ripple effect in matchups across the entire game. So I'm especially proud of how nicely all of these stats we came up with complement each other, which is all the more reason I sincerely hope the devs and QA team consider taking my advice. Dino vs Terra. Rip Terra. Dino vs Stego. This, alongside Karno vs Tenanto, is the most important matchup in the game, and ideally one of the most even. With our new proposed stats, Dino and Stego will absolutely annihilate one another. Mutually assured destruction, if you will. Fights between these two will last for literal seconds, and both parties have to plan their attacks stupidly carefully if they feel so inclined to make the first move. Stego, as you know, is our glass cannon. The glass part of him means that it will take Dinosuchus only four headshots to end his life. Remember, Stego takes two times damage from headshots, not 1.5. On the other end, literally, the cannon part of Stego means that he will four-shot Dino with headshots as well. As for body hits, Stego will die in eight Dino bites, barely surviving the seventh with 50 HP left, and Dino will die in precisely six Stego tail swings, barely surviving the fifth hit with 50 HP left. Stego was able to tank two more body hits than Dino due to Dino's absurd damage should he reach Stego's head. Oh. And back to talking about headshots, here's a treat for you. If Stego manages to survive getting bit on the head by a Dino three times, he will survive with 650 health left. If a Dino manages to survive getting stabbed in the face by a Stego three times, he too will be left with 650 health. If either of these animals are not careful while fighting each other, they could both be picked off just as easily by Karno's or Utah's waiting in the wings, even if they win the fight. Talk about taking mutually assured destruction to the next level. Dino versus Tenanto. Dino's new 600 damage, as opposed to his old 500, negatively affects Tenanto in this matchup, as instead of dying to four body hits, he now dies to three. We didn't really see this as a big issue though, because unlike Karno, under no circumstances would Tenno need to fight a Dino. He merely just needs to be able to escape 
escape from it. True that Dino has 1,450 less health now, but it's not like that will make much of a difference once you reach a certain threshold. Plus, it's not like Tananto was able to fight Dino's beforehand anyway, so nothing of value is really being lost here. Dino versus Utah. I guess Utah could technically kill a Dinosuchus if it went really far inland and just kinda let the raptors pounce on it, but with 600 damage, Dino's still gonna be one-shotting Utah, and proportionally speaking, Utah will be taking slightly more damage than before from a Dino if he gets bit on the tail. Similar to the Dino versus Tonanto matchup, we don't really think that this is a big issue, since nothing of value is being lost. Well, there you have it, all of Dinosuchus' matchups completed. He does pretty much exactly what he's supposed to do, be a big crocodile. Anywho, it's time to move on to... Dryo versus Dryo. With 150 health and 25 damage, these little bastards will be killing each other in six base damage hits. Sounds like a small amount, but trust me, with how agile Dryos are, one direct body hit will be a chore and a half to land. A lot of tail hits will also be delivered in Dryo v Dryo combat too. Also, not really too sure why two Dryos would want to fight to the death anyway. Dryo versus Hipsy. Dryo has 25 damage, Hipsy has 25 health. Hipsy's taking the L here on unfortunately. Sorry, Hipsy Colt. You know I still love you guys. Dryo versus Packy. Dryo can kill Packy in 24 packs. Sounds like too few, but when you're actually playing the game, it really isn't. If you die to a Dryo as a Packy, especially with that 80 damage lightning fast head swing with knockdown, just on install. We will not miss you. Dryo versus Terra. While it certainly should be possible for him to do, Terra should not excel in hunting adult animals of any species, even the smaller ones, unless they're absolutely tiny like Hipsy. This is a stupidly dangerous hunt for the Terra, as it should be. Dryo can easily intercept the Terra by jumping into it, and from there it'll only take four Dryo pecks to annihilate the Terra, three if Dryo lands even one headshot. Dryo versus Stego. Dryo easy clap, Stego gets one shot, Dryo stay winning, Stego stay losing baby. Dryo versus Tenanto. Rip Dryo. Dryo versus Utah. So a Dryo could kill our 500 health Utah in 20 hits, but our 80 damage Utah can safely kill a Dryo in 2 hits and send him running with the first one. If you lose to a Dryo as a Utah, you totally deserve it and your death should be immortalized in the form of a Twitch clip. Man, I'm writing this script right now and let me tell you that writing this got so much quicker the moment that I got Carno and Dino out of the way and it's about to go by even quicker. Hipsy versus Hipsy. Five times five is 25, five hits to kill another Hipsy in a mirror matchup. Hipsy versus Packy, rip. Hipsy versus Terra, L. Hipsy versus Stego, L. Hipsy versus Tenanto, massive L. Hipsy versus Utah, Joe Biden moment. <laughs> yeah, Hipsy gets five damage for the hell of it, but otherwise he's not gonna be doing much other than doing a little trolling. But you know what? That's okay. Packy versus Packy. Pretty standard mirror matchup. Packies will be four-shotting each other with their fully charged ram attack. They will also be eight-shotting each other with their head swing attack. The head swing is fairly tricky to land by itself in a Packy mirror matchup though, and Packies merely stun each other with it, not knock each other down. And just like in all of Packies' other matchups, he's unaffected by headshots, so Packies will often end up being able to tank more hits than they would appear to be able to on paper. Packy versus Terra. Packy's ram attack will, of course, insta-kill Tyranodon, while the head swing will leave Terra with a tiny smidge of health left, unless it's a headshot. Not like this will matter much anyway though, since the Terra will be knocked down. Basically, don't mess with Packy as a Terra. Packy versus Stego. Man, if you're a Packy, why are you even trying this? You're gonna get one shot and then you're gonna cry about it. Packy versus Tenanto. Although it's rare, Packies and Tenantos will trade blows from time to time. So, as is the nature of game balance, you have to take all matchups into account even the goofy ones. With Claw Slashes, Tenanto will be able to 5-shot Packy. He will 3-shot Packy with Kicks, and 2-shot Packy with Tail Slams. On the contrary, Packy will need to ram Tenanto 10 times if he wants to deplete its 1,650 health. Fractures exist too, don't forget, so that will also aid Packy in this matchup a bit. Packy's Head Swing Attack will be quite useless in this situation, since it slows Packy's momentum, and that'll lead to nothing but a free hit for Tenanto, and more than likely a free kill too. Once again though, Packy's saving grace in this this matchup is the damage reduction when hit on his head. If a Tenanto somehow misses a hit on the Packy after it's already been knocked down by a kick or tail slam, the reduction may be just enough to save his ass. It's not foolproof, but it's certainly better than a guaranteed death. Packy vs Utah The current Packy Cephalosaurus vs Utah Raptor matchup is relatively even, 
and it's going to be staying that way with our balance changes. It's similar to our proposed Dino vs. Stego matchup, in which both parties are faced with a massive risk. As you know by now, Packy and Utah have both been given health buffs, Utah 500 and Packy 600. They have both also received damage buffs. Utah's Bite now deals 80 damage, meaning that with body shots, Utah will be able to 8-shot Packy with basic bites. This choice of 8 Utah Bites to kill a Packy was made primarily because of both how quickly Packy attacks, and how Packy's new stats will affect Utah. Packy's max damage on his ram, assuming he charges it up, will be 170. Packy's ram deals both knockdown and potential fracture damage to the Utah Raptor. On top of this, Packy's base head swing damage will be set to 80. I'm sure you already see where this is going. If Packy lands a ram on Utah, that's 170 damage off the bat, leaving the Utah with 330 health left. If Packy is able to follow up the knockdown with the maximum amount of head swings, which would be 3, that's another whole 240 damage, leaving the Utah with a mere 90 HP left, and maybe even a fracture. Oh, and if Packy lands headshots on all four hits, meaning the ram and all three head swings, then that'll deal 615 damage total, meaning that the Utah Raptor is all but dead. Okay, that's all of this ugly little rats matchups covered. There's not too many more, so just bear with me guys, we're almost done here. I'm the one straining my voice discussing all this after all. Terra versus Terra. The only people who cannibalize as Terra are 30 year old neckbeards who want to own the spectator's epic style. Small children trolled, am I right? XD. Terra versus Stego. What are you even doing, man? I'm not talking about just the Terra either, I mean, what are you doing as a Stego trying to kill a Terra? Terra versus Tenanto. Okay, seriously, this isn't funny anymore. Stop trying to kill giant herbivores, you're a fish-eating scavenger. Sit down, sweat lord. Terra versus Utah. We wanted to give this matchup a teeny bit more spice than it has currently. Utah's bite damage is, of course, 80, and Pteranodon's health is 85. This will let Pteranodon just barely survive one bite from a Utah Raptor, giving him a tiny, tiny window to escape should he be caught off guard. If the Utah wants to make sure that his dinner doesn't fly away, he'll either have to pounce it or go for Pteranodon's head, either of which will secure the kill, guaranteed. Not a crazy important change, I admit, but I'm proud of this one, as I feel it's a great little quality of life thing. Stego versus Stego. Stegosaurus mirror matchups will be quite insane, perhaps wacky. One might even say a bit zany. With 1300 base damage on the tail swing, Stegosaurus will need four body hits to kill other Stegosaurus. With headshots, however, Stegosaurus will be dealing 2600 damage to each other. And if you have any understanding of math at all, you'll come to find that Stegosaurus will be two-shotting each other with our current balance changes if they stab each other in the face. This, of course, is thanks to Stego's two times headshot multiplier. Now, admittedly, this sounds quite unfair on paper, even to me. But the thing is, it makes sense, just logically speaking. Giant tail spikes, tiny head, yeah, that combination spells doom for anyone with a small brain. Literally. Also remember that back in Update 3, Stegosaurus had 4,000 health exactly. And while I'm not 100% sure what Stego's tail swing damage was back then, I do know that it was at least a thousand, meaning that back then Stegos were capable of two-shotting each other in the face anyway. Plus, since update 3, Stego has received a hefty turn in place buff, much like the rest of the roster has at some point. That'll make keeping your head out of striking range of an opponent's Stego that much easier. Going back to this line of thinking once again, if you as a Stego let another Stego intentionally place its meter-long tail spikes in front of your face, you deserve exactly what's coming to you. Stego versus Tenanto. So technically Tenanto could kill a Stego if it really wanted to, but hear me out for just one moment before you grab the torches and pitchforks. Tenanto's 300 damage tail slam would allow for it to kill a Stego in just seven hits, assuming all of which hit the Stego's head. Admittedly, I at first thought that this sounded like way too few hits, but then Z screamed at me, saying that the Stego would have to be a total idiot to die to an attack where the Tenanto is stationary. Plus, one Stego tail swing could potentially one-shot Tenno, or at the very least leave him with only 350 health remaining. So, in the end, I ultimately agree with how we have this matchup set up. I mean, of course I do. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in this video. Stego versus Utah. This matchup will, as you can probably guess, staying pretty much the same. Stegosaurus will have more than enough damage with its tail swing to devastate a raptor upon contact. It has enough power to kill two and three fifths of a raptor, actually. Furthermore, Stego's 40 damage bite will, while weak, be good at chipping away at a raptor's health if one gets a little too ballsy, should the Stego find itself running low on stamina. On the Utah side of things, its most optimal strategy will, obviously, be mobbing the Stego in a large pack by pouncing it. It will also take a Utah 53 bites to a Stego's body to kill it, as opposed to 
110 bytes in the current build. A Utah will literally never be opting to fight a Stego without pouncing though, unless of course it has a death wish. The improved damage from the bite attack is, as discussed earlier, to encourage smaller dinosaurs like Utah to tack on small yet noticeable bits of damage instead of having to rely solely on their special abilities to deal sufficient damage. Tenanto versus Tenanto, another basic run-of-the-mill mirror matchup. Tenos will be able to kill other Tenos in six tail slams, four with headshots, and nine kicks, six with headshots. Of course, stuns apply in this matchup, as well as bite and slash attacks for comboing and tacking on smaller portions of damage. Other than that, there's not much else to add here. Tenanto versus Utah. With our hypothetical stat changes, Tenanto will actually have to fear Utah Raptor again. While the current Utah is certainly capable of killing Tenanto, it's a disgustingly difficult matchup, even for a pack of Utahs. Currently, a Tenantosaurus is capable of clean one-shotting a Utah with its kick, that's ridiculous and should not be a thing. With our proposed stats, it would take a 10 3 kicks to bring down a Utah Raptor, two if at least one kick is a headshot. And while it's true that after one base damage kick, Utah will still be left with 300 health to spare, Remember that he just got knocked down. Even just one follow-up tail slam from a Tenanto would seal the Utah's fate. Speaking of tail slam, a headshot tail slam would leave Utah with only 50 HP left, dealing 450 damage total. After taking a blow that devastating, Tenanto would be able to finish the Utah in just one more hit from any attack of its choice, except for the bite, because that deals 30 damage. Just like the Packy versus Utah matchup, the reason Tenanto's damage absolutely eviscerates Utah is to compensate for Utah's vastly superior speed and agility. When you control the fight to such an extent, you should be punished for taking a heavy hit. On the Utah side of the matchup, Pounce will, yet again, still be kept as Utah's most optimal course of action. As for bite damage, 80 damage per bite against the Tenanto's 1,650 health would mean that it would take a Utah 21 base damage bites to kill a Tenanto. So basically, each time you bite a Tenanto as a Utah, you'll be chipping away at just under 5% of its health per bite. We felt that this value was fair because one, Tenno will be able to throw out twice as many attacks as he can now thanks to the stam cost reduction on his attacks, and two, in order for Utah to get a bite on a Tenanto, it requires him to get dangerously close. If your potential punishment for messing up a bite is instant death, the least that can be done for you if you pull it off successfully is for the game to allow you to remove a noticeable chunk of health from your opponent. Plus, to kill a Tenanto strictly with bites, that would mean risking darting in and out over 20 whole times. The odds of that are not in Utah's favor one bit. So if a Utah does manage to pull off a feat like that, applause to him, he deserved the win. And finally, Utah versus Utah. Utah v Utah fights will be a lot deadlier and a lot quicker now, with both parties being able to seven shot each other with base damage hits. We think that this change will be for the better if two Utahs end up fighting to the death, because it will add a lot more risk to the fight itself. More risk means that players will be more willing to go for Hail Mary pounces against their opponent if the battle isn't looking like it's in their favor. Things will be just made a little bit more exhilarating, that's all. In conclusion, and without a moment to spare. Wow, that's it. That's all of them. Every single matchup in Avrima covered. God, my voice hurts. But either way, there you have it. What you just saw is the number one way to balance the current Avrima roster and never have to touch any of those dinosaur stats again. Ever. I'll just throw those stats up on the screen one last time for ending's sake. The only thing that you might have to alter in the future is giving Stego a new mechanic once Rex, Spino, and Giga are added that allows him to stab his Thagomizers into their stomach and rip out their guts. But alas, that's a topic for another time. I want to thank you guys so much for sticking with me to the end on this one, because this is an issue that means a lot to me. I've wanted dinosaur matchups in the aisle to be as fair as possible since I first started to play this game, and unfortunately they've just never been that way. But I am incredibly confident that our ideas that we discussed in this video are the key to finally allowing for fair and fun matchups in Avrima. Oh, and please, if you guys see any flaws in my arguments or you notice a mathematical error, by all means mention it in the comments. Just like you, I want to make sure that the aisle has the best balance possible and multiple intelligible perspectives are key to making that happen. That means no raging in the comments, kiddos, and no attacking any individual developers or QA team members, please. We don't need a repeat of what happened last time I made a video of this nature. The only impact that I want this video to have on the Isles community is a positive one that will lead to a game where everyone can play as their favorite dinosaur and feel that they have a fighting chance against all of the others. That's true justice. I'd really be grateful if you guys would like and subscribe to show your support, and of course hit the bell icon to get notificated. Notificated? <laughs>
okay then, notified, to get notified whenever I make a new video. I'm Pesky, and I want to thank you all for watching. Godspeed.